This is Ben Woodford here at Modern Education Radio Hour on 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is a show where we dig into everything from current research trends to far out ideas concerning any topic even remotely related to education. I'm Ben Woodford, your host here in the studio. I'll be with you every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Here at Modern Education, we bring cutting edge ideas, philosophical discussions, insights from experts, and just about everything else you want to know. The goal is to help listeners interact with and understand learning in all its forms. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, you can tweet at Ben Woodford one on Twitter. I'll do my best to include your ideas in future shows. If you're a teacher, parent, student, or anyone interested in our collective future, I hope you'll tune in each week as we examine new ideas and interview guests from a variety of backgrounds. Welcome back to Modern Education. My guest today is calling in. His name's Paul Mailing. He has been a professional musician for almost 30 years. Paul is the founder and lead guitarist of the Hot Club of San Francisco, a group dedicated to performing and recording gypsy swing music. They have multiple CDs available on iTunes and have appeared on, at festivals throughout the world dedicated to Django Reinhardt and other jazz musicians. Paul is an accomplished multi-instrumentalist, and when he's not performing and recording with the Hot Club of SF... Paul is a contributing staff writer for Frets and Flat Picking Guitar magazines. He has been awarded a citation for excellence by the International Association for Jazz Education. I want to get Paul here on the line, and we will get started. Paul, are you there with me? Hey, I'm happy to be there. Hello, everybody out there in Radio Land. Hello to Radio Land. Yeah, so, uh, Paul... Uh, I understand you were born in Denver, but you grew up right here in Silicon Valley and went to high school in Santa Cruz. Is that right? Yeah, I went, I went to high school in Pleasanton and, and Santa Cruz. So, yeah, I'm a California boy. Oh, excellent, excellent. And what are you doing with your time these days? Pardon me? What are you doing with your time these days? Oh, well, I, I spend most of my time practicing the guitar and the violin, which I didn't do when I was a young man, so now I have to do it. It's better late than never. Oh, absolutely. That's great. So you're playing guitar and mandolin, and I know you're, you're part of a local or a, a internationally recognized band, but you're, you guys are stationed locally, uh, and you yeah. do a lot of work. So you've been playing gypsy jazz in the style of Django Reinhardt for quite a few years. Could you give the audience a tour of how you became interested in this lifelong pursuit for you? Uh, well, you know, that's a good question. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to answer, but since you asked, uh, uh, I spent the first 30 years of my professional life just playing gigs, you know, playing corporate gigs and any anything that would pay the bills. And so towards the end of that first 30 years, I got hooked up with my hero, Dan Hicks, who had a band called Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks, at which he had uh, broken up and started a different band, which I was part of, called the Acoustic Warriors. The title is uh, was Warriors because you got to be a warrior to play an acoustic instrument. You know, you can't just be a softy. So anyway, so I played with, yeah, <laughs> I played with Dan for almost five years, and we did a bunch of stuff, including Austin City Limits, which was great. That was like, you know, the highlight of my life. But it became clear to me for various reasons that Dan wasn't going to make a record and that I needed to move on, even though, you know, this was like the pinnacle of my life. I thought Dan Hicks and the, and the Hot Licks was the greatest band ever because it was acoustic, acoustic string jazz. And it sounded like Django Reinhardt music, mm -hmm. which is acoustic string jazz, you know, and so I was writing tunes for Dan, and we would play Django tunes, and I noticed whenever we did this that audiences would kind of go crazy. They really seemed to like acoustic string jazz, even when Dan was not singing. So long story short, Dan said to me, I think you should start your own band. And that's how the Hot Club of San Francisco was founded. It's a, it's a complete homage to Django's band, the Hot Club of France, and it's supposed to be a funny title, the Hot Club of San Francisco. Uh, it's a cumbersome name for a band, but it, it tells the whole story to those who know about Django Reinhardt. Oh, what a great so that's story. The short, that's the short answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you had a, a real mentor there who not only helped you develop your sound, but also kicked you out of the nest and sent you on your way to do bigger and better things. 
Exactly. You know, like a good mentor should. Oh, absolutely. Now, uh, this is a, a lifelong pursuit for you. And something that's always amazed me is the transformative effect of gaining mastery in anything. It seems to change the way we see the world and the way we see ourselves. Is there an aspect of your experience on the path to gaining mastery you can share that personally or as a teacher that's been transformative for you? Well, you know, they say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And uh, I had to get myself over to France in my 20s. I was looking for ways to learn how to play Django-style guitar, to play gypsy jazz. There was nobody in America doing it. There was a couple of guys down in Southern California, one of which you may have heard of by the name of John Jorgensen and his buddy Raul Reynoso. They were actually playing Django-style guitars in Disneyland. Um, and we all kind of traded LPs and cassettes through the mail. But none of us was really nailing it, you know? Um, so I got myself over to France to try to find some gypsies in the early 80s. And I didn't really find gypsies, but I made a bunch of cassette recordings of some guys that I was playing. I was actually playing violin with them, but I was spying on their guitar technique. And uh, so I learned how to do this. I came back home and transcribed the cassettes that I had made, you know, and really sort of reverse engineered the style of music. And at that time, I also saw other people doing it, playing like Django. We, you know, Django had a handicapped left hand. For the listeners out there that don't know, Django had a mangled, just horribly disfigured left hand. So he played guitar basically with two fingers. And nobody ever really played like him afterwards. And we all thought it was because of the handicapped hand or because Django was a gypsy or because it was just some kind of gypsy magic. Well, when I saw people doing it in France in the 80s, I thought, well, hell, it's it's doable. I could do it. I could learn how to do this. So I slowly, slowly, slowly learned how to do it. And... And get this, so this is this is to answer your question about the teacher showing up. There was almost nobody for me to learn from. And so I thought I should make instructional DVDs mm. for guys like me who want to learn how to do it. And so I put out a couple in the 80s on homespun tapes. And because of that, uh, PBS did a short little thing on me, and they dubbed me, they nicknamed me the godfather of gypsy jazz in America because – of the, uh, the instructional DVDs, or at the time they were video cassettes, but because I had sort of planted a bunch of seeds and encouraged, I won't say I taught, but I encouraged a lot of people to try this style, then there was this craze. Uh, and, and, and my videos were only a small part of the worldwide craze for Django. I think it, it was the beginning of the Internet, and everybody just started – finding out about Django, and all of a sudden his music was in more movies. You know, Woody Allen and people like him have always used Django on their soundtracks. And then after this craze started in the late 80s, uh, boom, everybody started playing like Django and buying the guitars and wanting to play. And this movement that I took, maybe that I can take a little bit of credit for, maybe 2% credit for helping create this worldwide fascination with Django, that movement kind of passed me by and all these young guys came along that were way better at playing guitar than I was. And that kicked my butt and I had to get myself into the woodshed and get better. So in a way, my teaching helped all these young guys learn and find other ways to learn. Their playing has taught me to be a better player. So I'm, I'm literally, you know, the expression hoist on your own petard a petard is like a little cannon, and when you fire it and it backfires and kicks back at you, that's when you're hoist on your own petard, and that's, that's what happened to me. Wow, yeah, so it sounds like you are really describing a reciprocal learning opportunity where you put out what you know into the world, and people took it, adapted it, improved it, and brought it back, and then you found yourself having to up your game to keep up with the work that you had actually started. So, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's it's exactly that. It's that symbiotic relationship between the teacher and the student, and I love it. I love getting my butt kicked. You know, um, I, I would prefer I would prefer to already have my technique in place and just be able to uh, enjoy life. But I spend four or five hours in the 
woodshed every day playing some instrument, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's because you're a professional, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's a chicken or the egg thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It always is, right? Uh, so... Uh, when we're we're talking about, I know you conduct music clinics and private mu- pres- private music lessons, and you're a staff teacher for the Jazz Masters Workshop. How long have you been doing this teaching uh, off of video, but it, with, in person with people? You know, I've been teaching all my life. Um, it's funny that that uh, you mentioned the Jazz Masters thing because I actually now I should update the resume that you're looking at, but mm-hmm. now I teach at the California Jazz Conservatory in Berkeley which used to be called the Jazz School. Um, it's the California Jazz Conservatory, and in the fall quarter they offer a uh, gypsy jazz class um, for people that want to sort of get familiar with the genre. And, I, I, you know, I love teaching. I love teaching in the classroom. I love teaching one in, one-on-one in my home here in Oakland. I just, I don't know. I, I, because I didn't have access for teachers to teach me gypsy jazz. I really love teaching. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but I know how to help people. Yeah. <laughs> at least that's what people tell me. That people tell me I'm a good teacher, so I'm going to brag. I'm a good teacher. Oh, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. You know, it's the, the love for doing it that makes us good at it because we always want to get better and we never want to let our students down. So we always bring something new and try to improve ourselves. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, so along those lines, I mean, I know you spoke a little bit about how the videos have brought out your ideas into the world, and then they came back new and improved, and it's really helped you up your game. But I'm curious about the actual, the one-on-one teaching and the group teaching and how that has helped you towards mastery and what you take away from that opportunity to teach others. Well, you know, the relationship between a student and a teacher, I have to, I have to, watch them and listen to them play. And so we play together and I have to manage what I'm doing when I'm watching the student, so that the student doesn't feel intimidated or any, you know, any pressure from me. Cause you know, for some people it's, it's a hard thing to play in front of their teacher, blah, blah, blah. But once we get past that point, I have to like do something to bring out the best in my students so I can see how far they've come and how far yet they have to go. And, you know, I have to measure that and then teach them something during the lesson that they can immediately put to use. And, and you know, sometimes when people don't have a teacher, they acquire a bunch of knowledge, but they don't know how to plug it in. So my theory is you learn something and immediately start to Im- implement it as soon as you can. Otherwise, it's merely information and it's not practical knowledge. So, you know, I learn a lot from students just by watching their resistances or their uh, lack of confidence, you know, and I try to help them over those kinds of psychological hurdles. Um, And sometimes my own personal experience helps them. You know, if I tell them, yeah, I didn't use a metronome till I was 30 because like you, I hate the metronome. But once I hit 30 and became, you know, like comfortable with the metronome, it, it really shortened my time in the woodshed. And when I tell people that, you know, then they go, okay, I can relate to this guy. He used to hate the metronome. Now he's given me a good reason to use a metronome. Maybe I should just use a metronome. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, that's one example. But, you know, music is full of those kinds of learning opportunities. Yeah, that's so good. I'm I'm thinking about what you just said about the power of immediate application. And I think that's an important piece of learning that you just threw out for the audience here is taking an idea and owning it immediately instead of taking an idea and waiting for the test in a few weeks and hoping that it sticks later on. Take it, work yeah. with it, do something, show that you have grabbed a hold of that. And that's powerful. Right. Even if it's, even if it, you know, the student can demonstrate the technique at a very slow tempo, that's fine. You know, the main thing is, is that they understand the concept and their hands can execute it at some, you know, with some degree of ability. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it doesn't have to be flashy or fast. It just needs to be there, you know, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I really like teaching that way. I, I, you know, I think it's just very effective. I, I have good results with that. 
Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I've I've had the similar experience as a math and calculus tutor and all these other things. And it really is amazing when you can see someone grab a hold of something that's new and challenging for them and do something powerful with it right in front of your eyes. It's really inspiring as a teacher. Nice. Yes. Nice. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about your success and your your exposure in the world and playing in, in Europe with the, the people who originated Gypsy Jazz. And all this success, I'm wondering, doesn't usually come on its own. So I'm wondering what type of mentorship or boosts you've gotten from people along the way, and if you have any stories you could share about fortuitous moments where something really great came along because of somebody giving you a helping hand. Wow, that's a hard question. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I've been really lucky that uh, I've, I've, I have been embraced by the Gypsy Jazz community, even though uh, I'm still learning. Um, for instance, the, uh, for the listeners out there that know this genre, one of the best living people, descendants of Django Reinhardt, is a guy named Borelli Legren. And I've met Borelli on several occasions. And one time, you know, we were having dinner together, and I said, listen, I, I really need to know how the gypsy community feels about Americans appropriating their music, because this is a typical American thing to do, is to take somebody else's culture and steal it and, and call it our own. And uh, I don't want to be doing that in this genre that was created by a gypsy, you know, and I'm not a gypsy, so I really have no right to be playing gypsy jazz. And Borelli said, no, 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 we dig it. We totally dig that you Americans are doing this because you're ed educating the audiences, you're teaching them who Django is, teaching them about this music and its history and culture. And then when the real gypsies, like me, Borelli says, when the real gypsies come to America, then, you know, there's more Americans that know who we are and we'll sell more tickets. So it's a win-win for everybody. And, you know, I thought that was fantastic. Oh, you know? absolutely. And then, and then Borelli says to me, hey, did you say you had a guitar with you? And I went, yeah, why? And he went, let's play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's like the biggest compliment ever. Oh, absolutely. It's an honor to get to have that type of permission to access that that genre and to, you know you're really priming an entirely new audience for them to be able to bring their music into a different scene so i agree i think that's yeah. an amazing and, and goal that's exactly why i started my band 30 years ago uh we're coming up on the 30 year anniversary next year and i started it just to teach people or to turn them on to Django reinhardt it was literally a consciousness raising a experiment on my part having a band called the hot club of san francisco and using the same instrumentation as the hot club of france which again for the listeners out there who don't know one of the things that made Django reinhardt's music so distinctive and why this genre of gypsy jazz is so distinctive as i mentioned earlier it's played only on string instruments but it's very kinky in that you have two guitar players playing rhythm at the same time that take the place of a drum set so you have two people banging on a guitar in a rhythmic fashion in unison and then a, a string bass and then a violin and then an acoustic lead guitar and that's the whole band and as a teenage kid when i was growing up i was exposed to this music and when i see pictures of the band the hot club of france i thought man this is like a prototype for a rock band look at all these guitars and these guys kind of look a little bit on the dangerous side like rock stars you know mm. and i got so turned on by it as a little 11 and 12 year old, you know, and like I said, then Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks came along and they were a contemporary group using the same instrumentation. And I was like, what? Yeah. So, yeah. So I didn't know that someday I'd be doing it myself, but I'm, I'm glad I got bitten by the bug. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's very fun music. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are glad you got bitten by the bug because they get to enjoy your music. Yeah. I, I've I've been listening to it since we scheduled this interview, and I think I'm hooked. It's really fun and entertaining oh, and yeah. intricate. I never can. <laughs> yeah, you have one more convert, I believe. So that's great. Uh, so Paul, hey, this might be a, this might be a good time to tell people to to visit the website. Uh, yeah, if, if they want to know more. 
so yeah, please give us your website. We just need to uh, just yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. It's super easy. It's super easy. It's Hot Club SF, like Hot Club San Francisco, except SF the initials. So it's H O T C O U B S F dot com. Okay. And we People want to go check that hey, out. They can yeah. check out the videos. You got uh, downloads, things like that that people can see. Cool, cool, cool. A little shameless promotion. Oh, Sorry absolutely, that, absolutely. No, no problem at all. So uh, I wanted to ask you about getting a break. You know, sometimes life just hands us a gold nugget when we least expect it because we're in the right place at the right time. Are, is there a moment you can think of where things just fell into place for you and helped you get to that next level when you least expected it or didn't know it was coming? Yeah, yeah. I've had a couple of those, but but the the best one was, as I say, I was just so enamored with Dan Hicks. And um, when he came back, he you know, he broke up the hot licks and disappeared for a few years. And I was really sad. The Beatles had broken up, and then Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks broke up, and I, you know, I was just really kind of lost musically, and I threw myself headlong into traditional jazz like Louis Armstrong, like Django Reinhardt, um, Coleman Hawkins, Sidney Bechet, all those 30s and 40s guys. I totally got into that kind of music, and then I heard that Dan Hicks was on the comeback trail, so I was practicing violin because... I really wanted to play violin with Dan Hicks. I was practicing crazy, like crazy, like crazy. And then a friend of mine was playing violin in the band with Dan. And he said, hey, uh, our guitar player is leaving. I can't promise you anything, but I can get you an audition. And I thought, this is it. This is like the chance of a lifetime. I'm going to get audition for Dan Hicks. Even though it wasn't on the instrument that I wanted to play with him, I'm, I'm a better guitar player than I am on violin. So it was the right thing. Uh, I did the audition, and I passed and got in, you know, and it totally, I went from being like a small-town guy playing guitar for a living to being like a guy who was touring nationally and being on TV. It was this huge, huge change, and, and I was ready Sometimes, you know, opportunity knocks and you're not ready and you have to kind of stumble through it or maybe you just pass on it. But this was like one where I was in the right place at the right time and it worked. And I'm here to tell you it was super great living through that period. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. You know, the, the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca said luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And it sounds yes. like you had the preparation in place so that your opportunity could come together. And that's beautiful when that happens. Yeah, it really is. And I thank my lucky stars every day for that opportunity and some other cool opportunities. Yeah. I, I'm curious, Paul, did you attend college? You know, I went to junior college and I even studied improv. Uh, uh, and I was already a gigging musician at the time. And mm -hmm. I just thought between the stuff that they were teaching in this improv class, which was a great class, but it wasn't stuff that I wanted to learn, and it wasn't what I considered practical stuff. So I just thought, you know what? If I'm going to do this, let's just do it. So I, I quit college, quit my day job, and just started gigging full-time because I got hooked up with some professional guys that were like in their 70s and 80s, and I was still like 17, 18. Yeah. So <laughs> and you... they thought I had the right stuff, you know? So again, I was in the right place at the right time, you know? I got lucky. I got yeah. lucky. But, you know, opportunity meets prep preparation. And... Right, right. Well, I don't think college really is for everybody, and I think it's a problem in our country that college is represented as the only way to be successful and that really robs a lot of people of the chance to be able to follow their dreams like you've done and I'm, I'm glad we're able to highlight that for the audience that this is there's always a way to fulfill your dreams and a lot of times it's not through college although college can offer a lot of great things to a lot of people but it's not the only route so it's it's nice to be able to illustrate that for people but, absolutely I, I couldn't agree more and you know the thing is uh, we talk about this a lot. One of the things that makes a good teacher is having an open mind to being a student, or as we call it, uh, beginner's mind. If you can, if you can hold on to your beginner's mind, then you can. Uh, you're more effective as a teacher. Oh, absolutely. And you learn better. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a better student, you're a better teacher. Yeah, they say the the worst thing for innovation is to call in an expert. 
Buddy. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I know you, you did some schooling in college, and I'm sure you did, uh, you know, grade schools and all that. And I'm curious, having the hindsight now being, you know, far removed from all of that, what do you feel like you took away from, you know, traditional schooling and the, the grading system and all of that? Do you have any lasting memories or feelings that have endured all these years? Um, personally, I was like a, a, an incorrigible kind of uh, troublemaker kid. I was really bright, so I was really bored in public school, and I had a lot of teachers who would, seriously, a lot, more than three teachers just, in my elementary school years who would say to me, you don't have to come to class, just turn in your assignments and do what you want during the class time. It's okay if you don't show up because you're too much trouble in the class. So I had a lot of, uh, I had been given a lot of liberties. And um, so that was kind of encouraging. And I also had music teachers that uh, really saw something in me and encouraged me even though, I, like I said, I was a bad student, I was disruptive, I, didn't, I often didn't do my assignments, I often didn't, you know, learn what I was supposed to, but I seriously maxed out on every learning opportunity that I had in my own way. But if I had it to do all over again, I would have played more by the rules. I would have done my homework, I would have, you know, learned how to write with, like, legible uh, cursive handwriting, I would have learned to read music thoroughly and comfortably so that, you know, because at my age, I still stumble when I read music. And as I say, I'm still in the woodshed practicing because I didn't practice my scales and arpeggios when I was a kid. Um, and so I, even though you and other people may think I'm like a raging success story, I, I still have a lot of humility and a lot of um, not regret, not regret, but uh, I would encourage people out there listening to uh, do what the teacher tells them. If you want to play an instrument, go to a good teacher and do what they tell you to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that's – there's a lot of really good points you made there. I mean, the first thing I wanted to highlight is that this the, – the, the way your teachers allowed you to – take your own way through things. I think that's rare in high school or in grade school for a teacher to recognize that in you and give you the chance. And a lot of teachers out there may be able to benefit from hearing this and thinking about how many students in their class might be smart enough to do the work and capable enough to achieve, but maybe don't want to follow the rules or sit through class. And that's an important thing to right. think about. You know, high right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about drawbacks? Do you think traditional schooling can have drawbacks or take away from a person's ability to be creative and innovative, like in in a career, yeah. music or otherwise? Uh, well, okay, so exactly like I said, I was in college uh, studying improv, and the teacher was a famous musician, and you know, uh, it was a great class. But I didn't like what he was teaching us. Um, so this is an example of where I think uh, the what was being offered was, was limiting because they were trying to shoehorn the musicians into playing bebop and learning bebop scales as if that was what jazz is all about. And my understanding of jazz is that it's more melodic and more rhythmic, and I think, you know, it's, it's pre-bebop. And um, so when I perform, I have this other uh, part of my brain, in addition to wanting to turn people onto music, I also want to teach people, teach people or give them the opportunity to learn that jazz is something that is easy to enjoy. <laughs> I think Americans think they don't like jazz because the jazz that they have heard have, might have been off-putting and not understandable and not relatable. And I think one of the things that's so great about gypsy jazz and certainly about early traditional jazz is that it's accessible. It, it's uh, People understand it. It makes them want to tap their foot and they can hum along with the melodies um, as opposed to bebop, which is a later, more intellectual you know, style of jazz. I think you know, for, for people that are just getting to know jazz, that can be really, really uh, off-putting, as I say. I can't think of a better word for it, just off-putting. So... Um, I've had learning opportunities where it was 
limiting to me just because of the teacher's worldview. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, that's one of the things that makes life interesting. Sometimes you get a teacher that doesn't teach you what you want and you get to learn something new. But I, I take it to the other extreme where when I'm teaching, I explain to my students, this is my personal belief system that this music is great, uh, and here's why. And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. You can always find another teacher. You know, I like to be real up front with my students, you know, about where I'm coming from so that they don't feel that same uh, square peg in a round hole feeling that I had, you know, when I was in the wrong class. Yeah. Does that that's your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it, it, again, it brought up a, a really great point as far as, uh, just any teacher in any field, they, it's it's a powerful technique or even a powerful way of being to just be authentic and say, you know, this is what I know, this is what I like, this is what I believe. I don't think you need to be just like me. I don't think you need to do it just like I do. But right. I should explain to you what I do and why I do it, and then you can make the choice for yourself. And it sounds like what that's what you're describing as your own approach to yeah. your students. Yeah. Yes, and being genuine, you know, I think that's the magic word is being genuine. Right, right, yeah, and people know when you're being real. People know when you're when you're pulling their leg, and it matters. It, it destroys your credibility as a teacher. It even maybe destroys your integrity as a person when you don't do that. So it's a, an important piece of being able to bring that authentic self to a learning opportunity for someone else. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. This is all great stuff, Paul. Thank you so much. So uh, I have a sort of funny question here. I'm going to shift gears a little bit for you. But if you could leave just one voice message and that voice message was left there to tell the world about your life and a legacy for you, could you record that voice message for us right now? Wow. Tell the world about my life. Yeah. You got a couple minutes on a voicemail. What are you going to tell people to remember you for? So basically, you want my elevator speech. Sure. Uh, I think I could do this, and and it's got to be like 60 seconds. You can have a few minutes. Take your time. We're not running out of voicemail space. Okay. So tell me when. Say go. Yeah. Uh, Please leave a message at the tone. Beep. Okay. So hi, this is Paul Mailing. I play guitar in a style called... Gypsy Jazz, which was originated by a gypsy named Django Reinhardt. It's a style of getting the maximum sound out of the instrument of an acoustic guitar that involves a a radical rethinking of one's technique. And when applied in context, it's usually played for dance music from the 30s and 40s, um, usually accompanied by another acoustic guitar. uh, of highly rhythmic and uh, harmonically simple yet deviously sophisticated music that is, like most gypsy music, is uh, contrived to give the listener a visceral response. And visceral means it should either hit you in the heart and make you feel melancholy or sadness or joy, or it should hit you in the gut and take your breath away, or at the very least, it should hit you in the head and give you an intellectual response of, wow, I never heard anybody play like that. So it's a little bit of something for everybody, some hot and some sweet, some melancholy and some bravado, all of that on a simple acoustic guitar. That's what I do. All right. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah. So I wanted to ask you one more question that's similar yeah, about your your music, and you have a lot of albums out. I've been sort of browsing through them this week. If you had one album that you could leave, and all the other ones got lost in a fire or something happened to them digitally, they all got wiped away, what would be the one album that you would want to preserve and why? Wow. I'm, I'm going to – I'll give you three answers. The first one is the least helpful. The, the best one will be the compilation record we're going to make for next year for our 30th anniversary. The compilation is sort of like the best of. Um, but since that's not available, I, I would be torn between 
my favorite record, which was the hardest record to make, and I waited all my life to make it, was the one where we just cover Beatles tunes. Um, I've always loved the idea of, you know, playing playing in a different genre with this instrumentation, you know, genre hopping. It's like, you know, it's like gender switching. But the, it, but then it, I think the first record we did, which is called QHCSF, like Quintet Hot Club San Francisco, mm-hmm. that's our very first record. And it had like three original tunes and one Beatles tune and a tune by Chick Corea and three tunes by Django himself. And it's just, uh, I'm so proud of that record still 30 years later because we we really nailed it right from the beginning. You know, uh, we just got the, the, we got it. We got it all together and we pushed the envelope. And I don't know, I, I, it's hard to brag, but I really still think that record holds up. I'm super proud of it. So that's, that's the one I'd recommend, the first one. <laughs> Yeah, it's something special about your first record, the the energy you put into it, the amount of dedication you have to making sure that it turns out good. It's something special that that'll never go away, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, it was just so impossible. You know, there was really, like I said, no other jangle bands out there in America. and Finding people to do it and, you know, the arrangements and which tunes to do and which ones to not do and it just all came together. It was funny. It was a yeah. miracle. Yeah, yeah. And it, now it's preserved, so it'll be there forever. It kind of I think makes me think of the old yeah. old blues albums that were cut once on vinyl in some old backwoods shed somewhere, and they've survived for all these years and been played over right? and over yeah. again. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's safe to say you, you play primarily acoustic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I use sound reinforcement, but I have a solid body electric guitar, and I've played it maybe ten times in my life. Okay, okay. So we yeah. can we can safely say you are firmly in the acoustic camp, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so now, as the years have gone on, and technology has become more prolific in learning and education and music, especially, what role has technology played in your experience as a performer and an artist? I, you know, technology, for instance, I started the band before the Internet. So uh, before the Internet came along, there was very little information on gypsy jazz and particularly on Django right in the hot club of France. There was very little information. So consequently, the only way you could get information was from LP records, you know, record jackets. And mm-hmm. they would often be in French because they were made in France. So as a kid, I took French classes, mostly so I could translate the information on the album jackets for these Django Reinhardt records. So technologically speaking, the when the Internet came along and everybody was finding out about Django through the Internet, it was great. You know, it was just like an explosion of interest. And, you know, guitar makers that make these kinds of guitars. Uh, when I got one of these guitars, it was super impossible to find. Um, now, you know, you just open up your browser and Google, you know, gypsy guitar, and you'll find easily like hundreds of makers for these guitars. Um, and technology, you know, for um, sound reinforcement, it used to be really hard to do a concert with all acoustic instruments. And now it's, you know, it's really common for uh, nightclubs and concert halls. You know, they, they've they seen lots and lots of acoustic in- instruments, and so they know how to amplify them now. But it used to be really a challenge. It used to yeah. be really hard. Yeah, yeah. So, so is it safe to say then that it's made your life easier and giving you more ways to be able to get your music out there and get people able to experience what you're doing? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Technology yeah. has been my friend. Oh, that's great, yeah. And what about for your, your students as they're learning? How is technology coming into play for people being able to learn a new instrument or learn a new style? This is good, this is good because um, because of the Internet and because of CDs and CD-ROMs, a whole generation of students has grown up learning how to play along with uh, with with backing tracks. We call them backing tracks. It's like having an accompanist uh, in your computer and you just push a button 
and the accompanist plays, and you can practice playing your solos against the accompanist. But because so many students use these pre-made backing tracks, they didn't learn how to become accompanists. Mm, yeah. So we had a whole... Some of the first generations of gypsy jazz guys could play great leads and great solos, but they couldn't play rhythm. They couldn't accompany. And so their value as working musicians wasn't really as high as it might have been if they had done it the way I did it, which is to learn how to be an accompanist. And then you accompany somebody in person like me and observe and ask questions and listen night after night after night after night. And it starts to sink in. But for guys that learn from, you know, backing tracks where you can't interact and ask questions, it, mm-hmm. it, it's sort of like you're just limited. Yeah. It, you're not fully developed as a musician. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like there is something lost there and not having the person-to-person dynamic and the, the back and forth that goes along with this real-time playing. Ab- absolutely. And yeah. it's really sad. It's sad to see it, and I see it a lot, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, hopefully we'll have some new technologies that can help people get to that level. But I think for now we're going to have to realize that we can't just lean on technology for all these things. Uh, Paul, yeah. I, I, I'm about out of time here, so I just want to thank you for making the time to come on the show. Thank you for all these great insights, and thanks for your patience with those technical difficulties at the beginning. And this has been great. Thank you so much. Ben, this has been great for me, and I appreciate the opportunity to reach all those people out there that listen today. So thank you, man. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.